Uh, welcome back. And uh, we were on a brief break. You were listening to a very good friend of our show, Agustin Rivera Jr., grew up in Driscoll, and we're always extolling the virtues of people in our Latino community that are role models. And speaking of that, a personal role model of mine, and also many of us in the community who also served our country and still does very valiantly. And uh, it is with great pleasure that I bring on a general that has served our country very well uh, on the battleground and here in America on our soil. Welcome, General. How are you? Thank you, Joe. Appreciate it. Could you tell them your full name for the record as the attorneys say in court? Como la mera cosa. Marco Antonio Cisneros. Andale. I like when you say that. Marco Antonio Cisneros. And uh, where were you uh, born? And tell us a little bit about your education, training, sure. background, your family. Sure. I don't think a lot of people know about that. I was born in 1939 in Bronzeville, Texas. My parents were divorced when we were very young, so I went to live with my mother's side of the family, Canales, in Premont. So I was raised in Premont. So when people ask me, where are you from? I say, Premont. But when I'm in Bronzeville, I have to say I was born in Bronzeville. Para que no se me sientan. And so uh, I went, started uh, going to Premont in the third grade. I went to, uh, through 10th grade at high school. Then I went to San Antonio to Catholic school, Central Catholic, because I wanted to take ROTC at Catholic high school level. And that made all the difference to me because I always wanted to be a soldier. Because I was born in 1939, and when World War II was over, I was about five years old. And so I was very impressed and, uh, with the veterans of World War II, so I was just waiting to go service to the country. And uh, I was raised in Premont, belonged to the rodeo club, fell in love with ranching, uh, had family ranches there. Uh, then I went on a way to college at St. Mary's University got commissioned as a regular Army officer because I was a distinguished military graduate and served for 35 years from 1961 to 1996. And uh, served uh, two different tours in Vietnam and I was a commander of the Army Force during the invasion of Panama, during the operation in Panama. And I was the one who captured Noriega and turned him over to the Federal Marshals. And to this day he's still in custody. Well, he's sort of in custody. He was uh, jailed in France for a while. He was jailed here in the United, United States, finished his term, and then the French put him uh, in jail for a little while because of money laundering. Then they released him about a year ago to Panama, and Panama has him in a, in a uh, low security jail there. Uh, and, uh, and they're thinking about, the last I heard, just putting him in under custody at home, in other words, stay at home. But he's still alive. Um, you know, one of the issues that uh, people really remember you for also is uh, in uh, the, the first uh, campaign in, in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, you served under how many presidents? I mean, it's been an, an, a very illustrious yeah. career. Well, I was appointed as a general when uh, Reagan was president. And then uh, I got selected for promotion to two stars when Bush was president. And then I got selected for promotion to three stars when Clinton was president. So those are the presidents that I, that I served under. And, um, you know, a lot of people, uh, the, uh, especially in our community and Latinos, my family are from Fal, Fremont. Mm -hmm. uh, every summer my father said, let's go work and pick melons for yes. Walter Storm in yes. Fremont. So right. we'd go work for Walter and Jack. Yeah. And Jimmy Storm here in Corpus, you know, we all know Jimmy mm -hmm. Storm. But Walter was such a great man and is a great man, and I think Jack passed on. Yes. And, uh, but that taught me the value of hard work. But the nicest guys from Premont, Texas, y Los Canales, we, my dad knew them really well, and we worked with a little fella named Gus. See, si, Gus. And, yes, yes, Gus. Gus and, is primo segundo mio. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And uh, he would always take me over there, and it reminded me, being in that town reminded me of the small town values mm -hmm. that you learn, mm -hmm. and uh, my daddy loved it. And he went back to school. He drove La Gloria bus. Yes. And then uh, Woodrow Laughlin's brother mm -hmm. helped him when he did politics to go back and become yeah, a Woodrow teacher. Laughlin. Thing. Yes, yeah. yes. And we remember all Bill those. Laughlin. You're talking about Bill, Bill Laughlin. Bill. Yeah. Bill was a great uh, friend yeah. to my dad, and uh, so. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, seeing you guys come from the same background. My daddy was born in 34, he passed on. Uh, my mom grew up in Fowl, born in 39 mm -hmm. as well. 
So they're uh, great fans of yours because they know vienes de ese rumbo, esa rama allá de mezquite. Um, but when you came home and uh, after all your military accomplishments, uh, you began serving the community. How did it lead up to the foundation? And, and by the foundation, I mean the Kennedy Foundation, but yes. how did all that lead up? Because obviously you, to be a leader, a general uh, with three stars, you have to be a m manager, administrator, and a leader all at the same time. And three of the things are distinct. You yes, know, I agree with you. In the military, you have to inspire young men and women, and you also, but you also have to be an administrator and make sure sometimes tens of thousands of people. I mean, yeah. so when you came back, this is something to wrap your arms around the Kennedy. T but people don't know what the foundation, they hear about it in the PBS, they hear about it in great uh, social consciousness efforts. But what is the Kennedy Foundation? Let me lead up to that. Uh, my experience in the Army was great. Uh, I don't think I would have accomplished as far as getting a position unless in the Army because it was an equalizer in society back then, you know, where the, the racial issues were more difficult. When I became general, I was the only Hispanic in the active Army that was a general for a long, long time. Uh, and uh, my uh, model and hero was General Cavazos. He was one of the highest decorated officers. He became a four-star general. A lot of people don't know that promotion in the Army only goes up to two stars. Three and four stars are presidential appointments. And so I always felt that I was promoted because of my ability rather than because of my being a Hispanic. And I always made, took pride in that. And, um, and so the Army gave me a lot of opportunities. Would I do it over again today? I'm not sure. Uh, I, it just troubles me to see when we have people killed in wars that are going to amount to nothing. That's Iraq and Afghanistan. I went last night to see the movie Lone Survivor and it just reminded me of a lot of things in that regard. But I was very honored to have served in the Army. I know that I was respected by the soldiers for being fair and strict, but fair and, and competent. And uh, when I retired from the Army, I went to work for, uh, for an uh, engineering company and I was an executive uh, in charge of all the uh, uh, overseas type programs that uh, they were very uh, uh, confidential. For example, uh, the monitoring of the bunker oil that we gave to the North Koreans under President Clinton in agreement for them to do something had to be monitored that they were using it on the utilities plant. So we had a team of people that would go and install the, the relays that would show that it went into a certain utility plant rather than to the military. And so th those were the contracts that I oversaw. After about a year, I was approached by the board at Kingsville, uni at University A&M Kingsville, it used to be A&I, and I was asked to be, apply for president. I wanted to come home. I was in California then. Although I lived in San Antonio, but my office was in California and, uh, and I had to travel a lot visiting the projects. So I came back to Kingsville and uh, was interviewed by the students and the faculty uh, and the regents. I was the first non-academic president for that university. And so uh, I, was, I went there to shake the tree. And uh, it was an eye-opener for me to see public education because, and I want to say this, Joe, I remember very clearly when I joined the Army, there was a report that said the uh, education achievement in South Texas is, is the worst in Texas. 35 years later when I come back from the Army, the report says that the educational and economic achievement in South Texas is the worst in the nation, in the whole nation. And I said, you know, that's very, uh, that's very unacceptable. What can we do to change things? So things have changed but not well enough. And I was glad to see Augustin talk about the love of a parent and them achieving because of their parents' influence. And that's the most important thing. If we're having problems with education, don't blame the teachers. Blame the parents, the parent involvement, the parent the parental values, and being involved. Because poor people can uh, put emphasis on education and get their kids to school. Augustine is a good example. Uh, and I'm an admirer of Augustine, and I'm glad 
see him run for a county judge. He'll be an excellent judge. And, uh, but what he said it was very true. That motivated me to accept a job at A&M Kingsville. I tried to have as impact as I could, but I only told him I was going to be there three years. Uh, and I was just amazed to see a lot of the things that, that I didn't think were right. And uh, the evaluation of faculty gave very little importance to how they relate to the community and their service to the community. Just think about how much communities can do if some of the professors at the university, local university, are willing to go and help give them advice. I mean, uh, they don't do that, and they don't value that. And uh, so that, I try to put emphasis on that. I, I then came and worked at, uh, St. Mary, at uh, Kings, A&M Kingsville for three years. And while I was there, I was recruited to be the CEO, Chief Executive Officer of the Kennedy Foundation, and that's what I'm leading up to now. The mission of the Kennedy Foundation really interested me, not making money, was what was paramount to me is coming back and serving in the community. Because when I went to Kingsville University as president, I took a salary cut from the position I had with the engineer company I had. When I came from the university to here, I took a salary cut also. But the mission interested me because it's a uh, foundation for charity, primarily in support of the Catholic Church. And so we give about 11 to 12 million dollars a year in grants to 501c3s, these are tax-exempt organizations. And the Catholic Church is a tax-exempt organization. So are the parishes, so are the Catholic schools. So I took that over and, and have been influential in, in influencing our board that one of our emphasis that we give in our grant giving is to all the Catholic schools in South Texas because they were dropping down. A lot of parents want to send their kids to a Catholic school because I think we Hispanics have a great family values. I, I hate that we're losing that, but we do have. And they want to send them to Catholic school, but they just can't afford it because they're already paying taxes, and now they got to pay uh, four or five thousand to get their kids to a Catholic school. And they have three or four kids; they just can't afford it. Most Latinos cannot afford to send their kids to a Catholic school, so we give to Catholic schools so that they lower the tuition to allow those that are poor to go to Catholic school. My experience has been. And I've been in the academic area, having been at university, and evaluated the public schools, and then looking at Catholic schools. Catholic schools do a much better job of success rate of kids going on to college, of kids you know, succeeding in life, because they teach them values, and they're no nonsense to a large degree. So one of my main efforts has been in the Kennedy Foundation to give grants to support Catholic schools. And we do that for every Catholic school in South Texas. Also including, we give tuition assistance to all the public universities. We generally don't give to any public entities, you know, state-supported or tax-supported institutions. But we do give to all the universities in South Texas for tuition assistance to help poor students succeed. And we also help uh, A&M and University of Texas uh, to have scholarships to be able to help students from South Texas. We give grants to every Catholic diocese in Texas. But our primary giving is in South Texas. That's where we give the majority of our grants. And I say it's 11, 10, 11, or 12 million. Depends on how our economy is doing. We're, we're a large foundation. We're the largest foundation that's a charity foundation that's located here in South Texas. And it's called the Kennedy Memorial Foundation. The full name of it is John G. and Marie Stella Kennedy Foundation. In short, we call it the Kennedy Foundation. The Kennedy Foundation uh, was a foundation that was started by one of two descendants of uh, John Kennedy, descendants of Mifflin and Petra Vela uh, K uh, Kennedy. She was a Mexican lady who married Mifflin Kennedy. Mifflin Kennedy was the one who brought Richard King down here and they started a riverboat company in the Rio Grande and they went and bought ranches and became very big ranches. The King Ranch became bigger, but Kennedy uh, was the brains really behind the whole operation. Uh, to start off with, uh, and he's the one who brought in the railroads. There's a town, Kennedy, named for him. And so eventually he had two grandchildren that inherited that whole Kennedy ranch. John uh, Kennedy, Johnny Kennedy, who married a lady from Mexico. And when he, he died and his widow took over, she then created the Kennedy Trust, and that's part of the ranch, that, but it's run by the Kennedy Trust. Of the Frost Bank in San Antonio. 
And then there's a Kennedy Foundation, which is the one that I had, that is a uh, public foundation and support of all Texas uh, ca primary Catholic entities. And that's about half the ranch, 235,000 acres. Oh, my goodness. So it's large. So if you put the two ranches together, it's about uh, 460,000 acres. And so it's a large ranch. Uh, and uh, our foundation, which is half of that, uh, the primary assets are the land. We have an investment portfolio. We have oil and gas leases. We have the first wind farm in South Texas that was built on the Kennedy Foundation. There's also one in the Kennedy Trust owned by a Spanish company called Iberola. That wind farm on the trust is the largest wind farm in the world on one private landowner. And ours is pretty close to it. And hopefully it'll continue to expand. So the assets we have is, uh, comes into our public foundation and we then give it all, it all goes to charity. And um, I'm proud of the mission we have. I'm proud of the f goals that we have. The Kennedy Foundation is a, is a very giving organization. We don't give to individuals. We give to entities. For example, the universities, all the universities in South Texas. Uh, we, we give to a lot of the, uh, for example, we give a, a grant to MD Anderson to support indigent care, primarily to people from South Texas. When they go up there, if you need financial assistance, you go to their office and they'll give you support for your transportation and for your uh, hotel expenses. And we say, we want you to give priority to poor people from South Texas who come and ask for help because that is the premier cancer treatment center in the world. It it's is. It's very expensive. And, and so we try to help those types of things. We also help the Baylor Cancer Center down in the valley in McAllen that uh, has a, uh, uh, the, uh, Baylor has a cancer treatment center for children in, uh, down in the valley. And we help them a lot too, to give uh, support and treatment for, for children down there. Very, very good cancer center. Um, and so that's the primary emphasis of what I do. I, I, I'm very interested, I like ranching. I was raised in Fremont, so I run the ranch and oversee the, and I have a ranch manager who happens to be from Fremont, uh, Omero Vera, and he's probably the best field historian in South Texas, very balanced guy, just like Agustin is. And so uh, I get involved in that, I get involved in the wind farm, and then I get involved in grants. Uh, make sure that we're focusing on having the biggest impact we can particularly for South Texas and particularly for the Catholic Church. Well, and uh, you were going to take a brief break. Uh, when we come back, I really want to focus in on uh, a key issue, the education of our children and the meaning of uh, uh, the Catholic education and uh, not necessarily just Catholic, but having that religious uh, exactly. that religious involvement, that faith, and, mm -hmm. and what difference it makes in education, especially today that we're in crisis uh, with our educational system. We're going to be back. You're listening to General Mark Cisneros and also, the, um, uh, also spearheading the efforts with the Kennedy Foundation. We're going to be talking a little bit about education more in depth than that and spirituality when we come back. Hi, this is attorney and board certified nurse practitioner Joe Flores on behalf of Vasquez Flores Home Health. Nursing homes have their place, but having care in your own home is very important. Call today for more information. Backed by over 20 years of experience, registered nurse Priscilla Vasquez can answer your questions about home care. Call 881-9922, that's 881-9922 today. I think it's a, a betrayal of public trust. That is just not ethical. I left the Democratic Party because of her. The reason is, is because you're taking Republican money. The money of those people that pay me as a consultant. What are you taking? Why did you take it cross town? Took money. I saw it and I saw them paying checks. Okay, hold on. Everybody
Have you or a loved one suffered a stroke, heart attack, unexplained low blood pressure, or death during dialysis? The FDA has issued warnings and recalled the product Graniflow and Naturalite used in dialysis. At least one national company failed to warn the public that over 900 people had suffered cardiac arrest or death. A condition called metabolic alkalosis developed, which may have caused the harm. Call the law offices of Joe Flores today. With a combined 25 years of experience in the medical field and as a trial lawyer, Joe Flores can help. Call now. We're back after a brief break. Thanks for staying with us. And uh, again, we want to thank all our sponsors appearing up on the screen, and uh, especially Vasquez Flores Home Health. And uh, also, uh, we give thanks to KTMB and the Lopez family for giving uh, Hispanics a voice in South Texas. Uh, we're back with General Mark Cisneros, who is also spearheading the Kennedy Foundation. And in our last few minutes of the program, I think uh, everybody that uh, all our, our Hispanic viewers and, and everybody else that's always welcome. We talk about the uh, value of education, but also spirituality and education. You touched on something, General, welcome back, about um, that there's nothing like a good Catholic education, but also th to have that spirituality. What do you think, if you compare and contrast right now the public system versus uh, the alternative system, such as the Catholic system? If you go back and you look at the performance of the students that go to Catholic schools, it far exceeds the students that go to public schools. I don't blame the teachers for that. Uh, there's a lot of parent issue that the Catholic schools, not only Catholic, but the Methodists and the uh, Lutherans and the Jewish schools uh, insist on that, and, and it, it, it gets parent involvement involved. In other words, parents who care will sacrifice to get their kids an education and that they meet those standards. My biggest concern about public schools, having experience when I was president at A&M Kingsville and going out and visiting public high schools, I was just astounded. Uh, and I can see why they're failing. And putting more money to it is not going to help it. One is parent involvement. You have very little parent involvement, very, very little parent concern about how the kids are doing in school. And, uh, and, and in my opinion, in most schools, they've lost control. There's no discipline standard. Uh, because we're a very litigation-oriented society. You know, uh, parents go in there and argue, you can't do this, can't do this, can't do this, and because of liability concerns, they back off, and they, they, they let the, uh, the wolves take over. And, uh, and it takes a very strong school board and a very strong superintendent to insist on standards, and you generally do not have that. Because it's politically well, controlled and all a lot that. of school board's members have no business being school board members. They have no education enough or knowledge enough, and that's not their primary orientation. They're oriented, who's gonna get the cafeteria contract? Who's gonna get the bus contract? It's a political thing and makes them have a lot of stature in the community. I'm a member of the school board. But they don't orient on how can we get the school to exceed the standards. The standard for public schools is very low. And when they get a rating among themselves exemplary, they give their superintendent a pay raise but look at the standard. The standard used to be an eighth grade standard. So we lower everything down to a standard that's politically acceptable, but you bring everybody down. And, and so that's the concern that I have about public schools. We're not getting the bang for the buck. So I do support the voucher system. I do support those things. You can see the school district here in Corpus where 18 schools out of 19, I believe, are required to allow transfers. That means they're not meeting the standards. We're in trouble, well, and, and you just can't blame the superintendent or the teachers. You've you, you got to have a community effort. Say, we're going to have higher standards. We're going, we're going to exceed. The standard for every high school graduate should be is he qualified to start college in college level courses. Why can't we bring the standard of the Catholics and the Lutherans and the Methodists to the public school? Because I don't see extravagant expenses at mm -hmm. Incarnate Word. Mm -hmm. I see it focusing in on the children. They eat the same food as the public school. You know, we as parents pay for the public schools and then we're paying for our private education of our children. 
that are blessed to do it. And I see a lot that get aid from the Kennedy Foundation. Why on earth can't we bring that standard to the public schools, General? Well, in my personal opinion, it's because you have the public involved in governing, and that's democracy. And so the school board is sensitive to being elected. The superintendent is sensitive to being rehired or recontracted. And so parents, people that vote are very active in politics, and there's too much apathy from the others. We have very low vo voter turnout. It's true. Very. And then the, we have a tendency that when we do vote, particularly down here in South Texas, we vote by political party. La palanca. Palanca. You know, and you vote yeah. for people who you don't even know because somebody tells you, just vote Democrat or just vote Republican y la palanca instead of being politically involved. That's one thing we Hispanics don't do. We have great family values. We ought to implement that in our politics and insist on that. We're losing that opportunity fast. We're, 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 we're getting down to the standards of the rest of the country, particularly, in my opinion, up to the poverty-stricken areas up north where there's no standards at all, and that's why you have all these problems. And so I don't know the solution to it, but it's not working, and it's just going to take moral courage from the community and activity by the community to be involved and support your teachers so that there is a standard. So if a kid is not performing, you don't just promote him to make him feel good or pass him on to the grade, and their parents agree to that. Hold them to a standard. And also, it is a discipline. If they're not complying with the discipline and the, and the school says we're going to expel him, expel him. Instead of, no, you're going to be sued and the lawyers get involved and we're, and that is what keeps our progress from getting to a higher standard. It's gotten so bad that mm -hmm. they banned parents that have not had formal training and conflict resolution. They come in there carrying on and putting pressure on the teachers where the teachers feel threatened, and they've banned certain parents from the schools. I mean, what is going on? <laughs> well, they're banning the parents, as I read it, not because they don't have certain education. They're banning the parents because of their conduct. They go to right. school and confront another student. They use profanity. They insult the teachers. And I think that's appropriate. You shouldn't allow that and tolerate that. But the community has got to support that decision to ban. Instead of, uh, you shouldn't tolerate incivility and la lack of courtesy, uh, and we've lost that. We're very, you look at your TV shows today, and, and who's, who's screaming the loudest? They're all talking, no one's listening. You know, because we lost a lot of sense of civility. You used to not do that. Us old timers who go back. When I was in school, I never told my parents that my teacher scolded me because I'd get a double whipping at home because I uh, defamed the, the reputation of the family. Now it's not that way. And go, it should be yeah. that way. Well, I, I think when in doubt, support your teacher. When in doubt, support your school. But if it give them a clear indication, okay, what are your standards? This is what we want your standards to be, and we will support you to attain those standards. Instead of somebody, some kid comes home and manipulating the parents, says, they don't like me because I'm a girl. They don't like me because I'm a Hispanic. They don't like me because I'm black. They don't like me because I right away, say, la, el padre o la madre, and no and charges into school. And, and, and so... Helicopter parenting, I like to call it. Hovering that's over... That's a very good term. Helicopter parenting, yeah. let's call it in the airstrike. Yeah. If so we how, use, how, do you, you know. how do you handle that? Well, it's a cultural change required. Putting more money in the school is not going to solve that problem. No. So No, you're right. You're we, right. We, we need to get more involved in, 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 uh, in involvement in our... Pro you get what you vote for. You know. and it has to be said. You know, yeah. I'm glad I brought you on because it does have to be said. My daddy was an educator for mm -hmm. uh, 30 years. He went back when he was 40 mm -hmm. to become a teacher, and that was right, exactly right. That's the way he raised us. If they got mad at you at school, it was for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> 99% of the time you go, as yeah. you said, you, you go. So uh, I think that we do have great parents mm -hmm. out there, but it's always that 10 20% factor that – they haven't learned conflict resolution or they see, as you said on TV, es puro murero. They're yeah. fighting and they're shouting, yeah. who can shout the loudest? Yeah. Nobody listens anymore. Exactly. Yeah. We got a couple of minutes left. How can people, ordinary folks, get involved with the Kennedy Foundation if they want to give, uh, if they want to get involved actively and help the foundation? And, and what can I do here on, on my... Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I get on top of my soapbox, but what could I do as far as get out the word on the Kennedy Foundation? First of all, the Kennedy Foundation is not a fundraising organization. In other words, we don't solicit funds. 
because we make our own funds. Amen. So that's a blessing. I don't have to go out there and con sombrero en la mano pidiendo dinero para que ayuden. <laughs> we get our money from 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 the things that I said. So yes, we're sir. very lucky about that. Uh, but how about manpower? Something to do. Get well, out the word. You know, well, what can we do as a community to help? Well, the community to help is know that there is help in most Catholic schools down here. And so they need to be able to go to the to them and say, I need financial help and ask. A lot of Mexicanos don't want to do that. They're, the pride, I understand that. Right. But there's a lot of things that are available, not only in Catholic schools, but in public schools. There's a lot of assistance for parents to help the kids go all the way through college. They have things that they never had when I was young. Scholarships, Pell Grants, and all that's available now. Student loans, and, and that's a disgrace in itself because the students end up graduating 50, 60,000 in loans, and, and, and they're in financial trouble to begin it's with. It's indentured servitude. Yeah. Well, you, the, you're, you're, uh, you're starting upside down underwater, owing so much money. They don't realize money. that they're gonna have that hanging on them for, for, for long, and they're using that for party money or whatever. Some of them are valid, but a lot of them are using it for party money. Right. And so uh, the parents have got to be involved. While your kid, when he's 18, or she, or he is 18 and go to way to college, they're treated as adults. The university does not send you their grades to the parent. Unless a student agrees to it, they don't give them the grades. They don't tell them how much they've gotten a loan. The student has got to give that to the parent if the parent insists. You want me to help you? You got to give me this information. Uh, and they're just letting the students go on their own and they're not mature enough and they end up with a big problem. Everybody wants to go to Harvard. Everybody wants to go to Yale. Everybody wants to go to UT. You know, sometimes you gotta, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, yeah. you know? I mean, you gotta start out and be realistic about finances yeah. and everything and, else. And capability. Not everybody should go to college. I know that's un-American to say to some degree. Leave no child behind. But it's honorable to be a plumber. It's honorable to be an electrician. It's That's what we need down here, yeah. welders for the platform. Exactly. It's honorable to do that. It's, it's the honor of work is more important. And so they, they, go, they go and get involved in, in, in uh, basket weaving in college. And a lot of colleges are willing to teach you basket weaving because that keeps them going. Yeah. Uh, and they don't have the standards because no, they don't insist on the standards. Uh, and so parent involvement. Uh, as Augustine said, is is the most important aspect of it. Oh, I agree, I agree. I I want to thank uh, uh, General uh, Mark Cisneros for coming on because uh, we got in. We started with a historical background, you know, about your service record, but then about South Texas in a way, but also to underline people. Your children are your greatest investment, and so is the spirituality of this community. We need to bring prayer back in the schools. I don't care what anybody says. That's what this country was founded on, and that's what the general served for. That's what we all support. We need to bring back that and our morals back. And um, I can't emphasize enough what a great pleasure it's been to bring on the general and also to talk about the most important thing, our children and education. Uh, final arguments, I always tell, even though you're not a lawyer, you're a general, but final arguments, closing arguments, what would you like to tell the public out there that are watching our program? Well, particularly the, the, the Latinos, the Hispanics, uh, la gente de nosotros, uh, is to get involved in the education of your child. Many of you didn't even graduate from high school, so you feel intimidated to be involved because you don't have the education. That's not the solution. You have to get in there. You have to get in there and find out, okay, I'm not smart enough to advise you what high school courses you need to take if you want to be a doctor. But there are assets available to that parent to say, if your kid wants a major in medicine when he goes to college, he better take biology, he better take chemistry, he better take algebra, and he better take all those courses that prepare him for that. Otherwise, when he goes to college, they say, you're not ready on that. You have to take uh, what is called development courses, and they get discouraged. So you have to know what your goal is going to be long before you even try to get there. So uh, identify what potential your child has. And some of them are going to be capable of being rocket scientists, and some of them are going to be premier plumbers. And then get an oriented on which is the best course to get there, and know, even though you yourself have not had that education, but you then insist, you're going to be a doctor, that's what you want to be, that's what you're interested, you better take these courses. Although I've never taken them myself, but you better take these courses in high school and monitor how they're doing on that. So what I'm saying is parent involvement and what courses they're taking, because the kids are given the choice in a lot of cases. 
when they go to school. And guess what they'll do? They're going to take the easiest way out. They're going to take what their friends tell them, uh, you know, whatever, for whatever reason. Basket weaving's Basket good. weaving, so they end up taking basket weaving. If you left it up to me, I would have just majored in rodeo when I was in Fremont. <laughs> and you would have graduated with honors. But my mother, who was divorced, you know, insisted on high standards and insisted that that we go a certain path. Parents have the greatest influence on young children. And so I'm always I'm also grateful to my particularly my mother who influenced me. Our parents gave, gave me the greatest compliment when I would bring home good grades, they'd say nothing. <laughs> because they say that's just expected. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. Um, I mean, what do you want? Que quieres una medalla de oro? I mean, for yeah. doing your job? Yeah, what's you, your job? I tell my little girl and she's watching out there, I tell her, "What's your job?" She says, "Make good grades, don't get in trouble." and do what my instructors say at IWA. So my little angel at home and, and all of our angels there, I encourage everybody to look into the resources to educate your children.